I'm convinced Darling in the Franks is the new Evangelion. No, I don't mean in quality per se, that's totally your opinion. I mean in divisiveness. Whether you love or hate Darling in the Franks won't really matter for most of what I'm going to talk about, but what I do say may sway your feelings on the show itself. Who knows really, I I'm not you. I'm just stating a possibility. Darling in the Franks isn't over yet, which is quite unusual for me to make a video these days about a show that's yet to end. I just recently caught up with it today after stopping at episode 13. So instead of actually picking it up at episode 14 and continuing to watch it, I started back from the beginning and chronicled any questions or problems I had with the series. I noted when those questions or problems became fixed or became worse, and I talked about each episode for a bit of time with my girlfriend as we watched it. We passed right through the problems people seemingly had with Ichigo, and the aliens of the latest few episodes. Scott Report, a somewhat acquaintance of mine that some of you might know, took to the subject of Ape and Virum on Twitter, as he stated quite simply, if you didn't see they were a menace, you weren't paying attention. He tweeted about many other things, like people turning on the show, just because of big anti-tubers making videos about the show turning to shit for whatever reason. Let me make this clear, big anti-tubers that make straw man arguments against the show because they can't actually criticize it. And that's just not how the world works at all. The problem with this plot point is that the livelihoods of companies and entire nations depend on the world's current oil-based energy infrastructure, and there is so much technology from cars to electric grids that would need to be retrofitted to use magma energy instead. And there is no way in hell that the oil companies would just let a new resource render everything that they've done obsolete without a fight. I totally agreed with you about how the series handled its answers to its mysteries, Jeff. Why did you have to go down the route of complaining about how impossible a plot point would be in the real world and pass it off as actual criticism of a fictional piece? That's not to say I'm decrying the general concept of this. I'm a firm believer that there needs to be a level of realism in your fiction for the audience to connect with it, but this is such a nitpick. Jeff's video comes off as a big, unresearched cry about how the show didn't go the way he wanted, and it's one of my major problems with talking about things that aren't finished yet, because the episode following his video proved a lot of his arguments wrong. This is a simple what if. Isaac Asimov once said, Science fiction, given its grounding in science, is possible. Fantasy, which has no grounding in reality, is not. This has been a major point of contention in the genre and in arguments around what pieces fit within that genre. Take Star Wars, for example, one of the biggest targets for the argument of science fiction versus fantasy, with some defenders classifying it as a soft sci-fi, and those on the opposing end throwing it into the category of fantasy. Whatever you believe Star Wars is, it's important to take away from this the spectrum of the sci-fi genre, which ranges from a hard sci-fi which makes all of its science make sense, and soft sci-fi, which might make some little details here and there a little different. Science fiction belongs to a larger umbrella genre known as speculative fiction, which is exactly what Darling in the Franks is. Speculative. What if humans become immortal? What if we lost the ability to reproduce? What if we gained the ability to clone? And, most importantly, how would the government use this to control us? In the end, this criticism is just a criticism of the genre the show fits in. Is it science fiction by the use of technology in its fiction? Is it just a soft sci-fi tale, or is it fantasy? Your answer to this doesn't matter. I've seen arguments for and against Darling as sci-fi in the comments of Jeff's own video, especially a detailed one that explains how Ape could have legitimately pulled all of this off. What does matter is this is just trying to place the show into a genre, not a critique of the actual show itself. Now let me be completely transparent. I don't think Darling in the Franks is on any comparative level to most of its predecessors, such as Evangelion or Gurren Lagann, but I can't help but see a trend here. Let's talk about the rebuild of Evangelion for just a second. You know, the film series that has yet to end? The third film in the series, You Cannot Redo, had an extremely divisive setup. 
completely changing the Evangelion universe as we know it, while simultaneously bringing back familiar plot points from the old series. The series took a completely different route than the original, and people just didn't like it. Despite getting one of the least developed characters, Kaoru, even more fleshed out, and arguably having a more emotional payoff during his death. Some people complain about how quickly Kaoru was introduced into the original TV series and then discarded. Generally, I don't agree that it made for a weak relationship between him and Shinji, but it's nice to see it handled in a different light with a bit more time to it. The whole point is, the fourth Rebuild movie has yet to be released, and we don't know where Hideaki Anno is going to take the story from here. And seemingly, the same exact thing is going on with Darling and the Franks. There were videos outright lying about Atsushi Nishigori's previous works to discredit him. It just feels worthless. Viram's introduction really wasn't that hard to understand. And while I do agree that it could have been done better if more time was dedicated to it, this perpetuates a hate train against the show worse than which already existed. This is a total Gainax thing to pull. Everyone who knew anything about Gainax or Trigger expected some kind of twist near the end about everything that was going on. But I almost can't shake it off that if Evangelion's original TV series was airing at this very moment, it would be the exact same story. I want you to imagine for a second if episode 25 of Evangelion just finished airing. We'd be seeing videos by the biggest of the big about how Gainax ruined the narrative of a great show or what the fuck is Ava episode 25? Don't believe me? Look at their reaction simply to the art style of Berserk 2016, without much thought into anything else about it. Aside from the first episode, it was a pretty decent adaptation, it's just that it lacked in the visual and audio departments. They weren't even able to rank near average, but we'd have also had mass outcries about the still scenes like the infamous elevator, or Kaoru's death, or the direction the show went in delving into the minds of the characters. The unfortunate thing though, is those actually did happen, which led to the creation of End of Evangelion. Just imagine how loud those arguments would have been heard today. So really, is this any different? It's not hard to see this trend with Trigger and Gainax shows either. Kill a Kill is dismissed as a show simply being about fan service for the sake of fan service. Tengen Tapa Gurren Lagan is sometimes proclaimed as shit for either killing off Kamina or for the second half of the show, spitting all over the first half, because it was out of nowhere. Then there's the obligatory Evangelion is too complex, with defenders screaming that it's too deep for the haters. Darling seems to fit into all of these categories. Now like I've said, I'm not someone who's gonna sit here and claim Darling in the Franks is topping Evangelion in any way, but that's totally up to your own opinion if it does. I'm also not going to sit here and degrade it though, for I see a unique Taken Darling that pays homage to Evangelion, but altered in a slight way, questioning the definition of humanity in different ways than Evangelion did, even if slightly. We can make our own comments, our own criticisms, or whatever they may be, but the harder you grasp at straws, the less weight your criticism is going to have. We didn't see this that long ago with Persona 5 the animation, yet another say what you will about it kind of show, but criticisms reached as far as making fun of background CGI characters to complaining about how the all-out attack sequence was handled in the first couple of episodes, and even as far as taking zoomed stills from the Daybreakers OVA to try to tarnish the anime before it even started airing. This is the trend I've been trying to shy away from. These are examples as to why I distance myself from the current conversation as much as I do. But with how this blew up, I had to throw myself out there on this subject. And of course, you can expect another video about Darling once it's over. I'm in discussion with a good friend of mine, Evanito, about a video we're going to make on the series. You can expect one about Persona 5 the animation, too. There are some things I actually want to say about that. It's hard to stay out of the current conversation entirely, especially when you're surrounded with it, but it goes both ways. We judge shows both positively and negatively, before we even have time to think about it, what it is that they're offering, or how they're constructed. We react swiftly to changes in our stories this way. 
the sounds are there. It's sickening. It's sickening how people are turning their back on this series where things before this series came along did the exact same thing and nobody batted their eye. Nobody said anything about it. Let's talk about Evangelion for a minute because that shit brought us a central character in the last three episodes. I want to thank those that have pledged to me on Patreon, especially Justin Chipman. Also, please check out Scott Reports and Evanito's videos, especially those on Darling and the Franks. No matter which side of the coin you're on for the show, you might find something worth your time in their videos.